Welcome to my podcast on bagpipe composers and bagpipe music. My name is Jordan Key. I am a composer and a bagpiper, and I started this podcast and its related series of musical recordings to share with you music for this instrument that I love. This is episode one, entitled Peter R. McLeod Sr., the piper whose music was too difficult. And since this is the first episode, let me briefly explain what this podcast is all about. In my musical career generally, it is my goal to share interesting and compelling music that few people hear or know. This pertains as much to Renaissance polyphony as it does to bagpipe music. However, here we are just looking at bagpipe music. I have spent years and hundreds of hours working in libraries, reading through hundreds of bagpipe music books, compiling and playing through thousands of tunes to bring these collections and gems to your ears. Some of these pieces a bagpiper might know, but many they likely will not. Maybe with time, some of these forgotten masterpieces will reemerge within the popular repertoire for the bagpipe, should we lend them our ears. If you are not a bagpiper, then this podcast is still for you, because it is also my mission to garner more interest from the broader musical community in the bagpipes. The bagpiping world is very insular. Coming from a background of diverse classical and folk musical training, playing many instruments from the pipe organ to the bagpipes well, performing in orchestras, jazz bands, chamber choirs, and even avant-garde musical ensembles, working as a professional composer of contemporary classical music for all sorts of instruments, composing ballets to string quartets. I would like to see the bagpipes become an instrument better understood and respected by the classical musical community, and considered as an instrument worth composing for and incorporating into musical ensembles, without the prerequisite of the composer themselves being a bagpiper, which is the case nearly 100% of the time presently. I would love to see the modern non-bagpipe playing composers become more interested in composing for this bizarre and beautiful instrument. See this channel as a resource to you to see the tradition of this instrument. The series is about the present repertoire and the history of bagpiper composers. This is some of the best music the instrument can offer, but so much more is possible if we just stretch our compositional imaginations. My hope for new avenues springs eternally. Today I would like to present to you one of the greats of bagpipe composition, Peter R. McLeod Sr., who lived from 1879 to 1965. Over the past month I have released recordings of all the published music I have been able to find by Peter McLeod. A few of these pieces are in the popular repertoire, but many have fallen out of fashion, and some were likely never in fashion. However, nearly all of these works are excellent, and those which have never found favor amongst bagpipers should likely be put on the proverbial table for reconsideration, for inclusion in the popular canon of great bagpipe music. So, let's begin considering. Peter R. McLeod was one of the iconic bagpipe composers of the late 19th and early 20th century. Son of Hector McLeod, Peter was born to a family of three brothers and five sisters in Ardeug on the island of Lewis on December 13, 1879. Peter was originally named Roderick, but changed his name to Peter Roderick McLeod after his brother Peter died. Around 1900, Peter went to Glasgow with his wife, Christina, where he worked as a shipwright. Sometime in that same decade, Peter joined the Territorial Army, and by 1903 was under the leadership of Pipe Major Edwin J. McPherson, who was known as both a splendid piper and a highly competent instructor. McPherson quickly polished the battalion pipe band into an accomplished bagpipe band, winning the 1906 Argyle Shield in the first World Championship competition open to every pipe band in Scotland. In 1908, the Territorial Army was reformed into the 7th Cameronians, also known as the Scottish Rifles. Peter McLeod is listed as a piper in the regiment at this time under Pipe Major McPherson. It was possible that during this time, Peter wrote his masterful 2-4 march, the 7th Battalion Scottish Rifles. This work is particularly clever for its use of tone painting through the numerous Burl and Torlua ornamentations. Through the rapid succession of these compound grace note figurations, along with their use in the context of large melodic leaps, Peter is clearly attempting to imitate the sound of a battalion of rifles in a firing squadron. Furthermore, Peter is clever in his use of the limited set of pitches on the bagpipe. In this piece, he reserves the introduction of the C in the third part of the tune. This lends a freshness to the work halfway through, totally changing the color of the piece. Take a listen 
to this truly marvelous tune by Peter R. McLeod Sr. In 1914, the regiment was mobilized and sent to Catterick Camp in Yorkshire, Peter composing his eponymous tune at the time. Catterick Camp, by comparison to the 7th Battalion Scottish Rifles, is a quaint tune in D major, a bit less colorful and more carefree. Here we can hear the first part of the tune. In 1915, during World War I, the regiment was sent out to Gallipoli, and, after heavy losses in battle, the regiment was joined with the 8th Cameronians. After Gallipoli, the Cameronians, along with Peter MacLeod, served in Egypt, Sinai, and on the Western Front. By 1919, Peter was discharged from military service. Peter continued working as a shipwright until about 1927, when he was involved in an industrial accident, wherein his right leg was entangled in a winch's gearing. His leg was ultimately amputated, requiring him to not physically work again until 1941. He was fitted with an artificial leg, but was in pain from the injury for much of his life. It was after this accident that he became known as a composer and bagpipe teacher. In 1928, Peter McLeod Sr. introduced his youngest son, Peter Jr., at the age of 12 to the piping world, where he was considered a relative prodigy, becoming the youngest piper to win the Open Strathspey and Reel competition at Inverness in 1932, at the age of 16. From this time onward, Peter McLeod Sr. had a reputation as an astute instructor. Peter Jr. would often showcase his father's new tunes, since most other bagpipers at the time generally were all uninterested in Peter McLeod Sr.'s outrageous style. One such tune showcased by Peter Jr. 
was the 2-4 march, The Conundrum, composed around 1930. Though it is widely popular today, its rhythm and technique were quite exceptional for the time. Let's listen to The Conundrum, perhaps Peter McLeod Sr.'s most popular tune today. As hinted at, Peter McLeod Sr.'s road to becoming a recognized and beloved bagpipe composer was not easy. Much of Peter's music pushed the bounds of what was considered tasteful and playable at the time, and consequently few bagpipers beyond Peter McLeod Sr. and Jr. would play the music, and much of it was deemed inappropriate for competition. John Wilson, bagpiper, bagpipe composer, and first publisher of Peter McLeod's music, provides us with an interesting anecdote to this end. John Wilson writes, and I quote, I first met Peter McLeod at a piping competition in 1934, 43 years ago when I was a young man of 28. He was bewailing the fact that he couldn't get anyone to play his compositions because of the general consensus of opinion that they were too difficult. Someone, I forget who it was, said, quote, Give them to Wilson, he'll play them, end quote. Peter looked at me expectantly, and I said, quote, I'll be very pleased to have some of your tunes, Mr. McLeod, and I'll let you know what I think of them." End quote. I did receive the tunes, and also some composed by his young son, Peter McLeod Jr., a very likable young chap and an excellent piper. When I tried the real John Morrison of Assant House, I was mortified to find that I couldn't manage the new intricate fingering, and in a fit of pique, I condemned the tune and just set it aside. A week or so later, I realized that I had been a bit hasty, and so took out the tune again, and commenced to practice it very carefully. Although it was indeed difficult, I ultimately mastered it and, of course, found it to be an outstanding composition, which I included along with the others in my first book of Highland Bagpipe Music. Those were the words of John Wilson in Willowdale, Ontario, on May 22, 1977. Let's take a moment to listen to Peter's reel, John Morrison of Assant House, which is perhaps one of Peter's most fiendish pieces ever published.
Much of the charm of this piece is that it lacks the third scale degree, and so is in amixolydian and hexatonic. The ambiguity of the third, which usually determines the major or minor sense of the mode, makes this piece sound decidedly rustic if not bold. The piece also orbits the upper range of the instrument around E and G natural, which creates further ambiguity as to the final of the piece's mode. Are we in A or E? A mixolydian or E dorian? Peter uses all these ambiguities adeptly to fashion a piece that tests not only the piper's fingers, but the listener's ears. As many composers of various kinds of music have experienced at many points in music history, Peter R. McLeod was ahead of his time and unfortunately victim to close-minded traditionalists. Such myopia is still a problem in bagpiping competition circles today, the administrators and judges of which generally frown upon new or even obscure traditional music being included in the competition repertoire. Fortunately, however, Peter R. McLeod's music is now considered acceptable for performance and is widely played today among professional and amateur bagpipers. Peter McLeod had three sons and three daughters. His sons Hector, Ian, and young Peter all played the pipes, and his daughters Dora, Georgina, and Christina played the piano. Both Peter Jr. and Hector wrote pipe music, though Peter Jr.'s music is far more proliferate and well-known today. Of course, Peter Sr.'s son, Peter R. McLeod Jr., who lived from 1916 to 1972, was a composer in as much the same mold as his father, so much so that there is some controversy about whether father or son composed some Peter R. McLeod tunes. Some have been proposed to have been joint efforts. One such clear joint effort was in the series of Strath Spays entitled Gaelic Mouth Music, all three of which demonstrate not only the piper's respective virtuosities, but also their respective penchants for the exceptional setting of traditional Scottish forms. Let's listen to the three Strath Spays the first of which is composed by the father, the third of which is composed by the son, and the second of which we do not know for certain and could perhaps assume that they composed it together. Here is Gaelic mouth music, numbers one, two, and three.
will discuss Peter R. McLeod Jr.'s music in more detail in a different posting dedicated to his music exclusively. We have only a few compositions by Hector available to us today. Since there is little information about Hector's life and works, I will take a moment here to present one of his two published works, the 2-4 March in D, Ronald McLeod. This simple 2-4 march builds nicely from a relatively even-paced first part to a rhythmically exciting final variation. Let's take a listen. You can find Hector's other published work on my YouTube channel. It is also 2-4 March and is entitled Hector's Wee Torque. Ronald Peter McLeod, for whom we get the title of the previous work, is the son of Hector McLeod. Ronald reports that his father wrote many of the intros and final parts of Peter R. McLeod Sr.'s tunes. Additionally, grandchildren and children of Peter McLeod Sr. report that Peter's wife and daughters also contributed ideas and variations to Peter McLeod's music. Unfortunately, no record was kept as to which tunes and which parts were composed by Hector, Peter's wife Christina, or their daughters. Though there are likely over 200 tunes written by Peter McLeod Sr., we have only 50 original compositions along with a few arrangements of traditional tunes available to us today. Peter's music has been published in various books, the most comprehensive collection being the Bicentennial Collection Volume 2, published in the U.S., but not all of his tunes were published, and many are lost. For example, Peter composed a Pia Brock called Salute to Dame Flora McLeod of McLeod, which earned him many accolades according to written records. However, the score has been lost and no audio recording exists. There is still music that he wrote, which has been unheard. Maybe one day all of his music will be published and in one collection. Despite his pain and uncomfortable existence from his industrial accident, he never stopped writing and lived until he was 87, dying on the 16th of June, 1965. It is difficult, without having a comprehensive biographic of Peter R. McLeod, to know how every piece and name fits into his life. While some of the titles of his works have obvious connections, such as the names of his children or spouse, some I can only assume were people Peter was acquainted with professionally, as a piper, or whom he at least admired from afar, whether for piping or other merits. If you happen to come across this video and or playlist and have some additional information about any of the pieces, please leave your information in the comments section with the appropriate piece. 
I would love to gather more information about the history of each piece as much as possible. Now I would like to highlight some other works, which I cannot say much about biographically, but which deserve mention for their compositional merits alone. I will not excerpt the whole pieces here, since they are all available in the playlist for Peter R. McLeod Sr. on my channel, but I will play at least one part from each, so you can get a feel for the majesty of Peter's composing for the bagpipe. Peter R. McLeod's oeuvre is most heavily bent towards the march tradition, with two four marches significantly outnumbering any of the other traditional forms. Nearly all of his two four marches are worth a listen. Some are charming and simple, while many are virtuosic and full of clever conceits. In addition to those already mentioned in this presentation, three more stand out to me as truly exceptional. James McKeever, Murdo McLeod, and Morag Ramsey. If you like Peter's famous tune, The Conundrum, then you might also like James McKeever, which uses many of the same rhythmic conceits. The idiomatic Scotch snap rhythms are rife and charming, while Peter clearly has a honed sense of forward motion and repose, which he artfully balances throughout the piece. Here is just the third part of this work. The 2-4 march, Murdo McLeod, is also exceptionally clever, and at least by my estimation, better than either The Conundrum or James McKeever, though both works are quite good. There is a refined sense of rhythm in Murdo McLeod that we only get glimpses of in The Conundrum and James McKeever. Here we see not only the tradition that Peter sits within, forerunning great composers like John McClellan and Angus Mackay, but we also see his radical sentiments, at least radical by the measure of early 20th century bagpiping communities. While not unique, the cadence Peter provides in this piece is also fresh. While most 2-4 marches in A Mixolydian from this period, and generally in any period, cadence with a melodic C-sharp to A on two strongly accented eighth notes, Peter gives us an interesting scotch snap from B to A with an emphatic low G grace note between. Given the melodic gestures that lead up to this cadence, I find the writing quite remarkable. Let's listen to the final part of this tune, which will be the bottom three lines of this score. The third 2-4 march of note is Morag Ramsey, which oddly can also be found in another source under the title John C. Johnston. The settings are nearly identical barring a few notational idioms which don't change the tune. I am unable to ascertain why there was a change of title. The title John C. Johnston appears in the publication The United States Bicentennial Collection of Bagpipe Music Volume 2 from 1976, while Morag Ramsey appears in The Eadcath Collection of Highland Bagpipe Music Book 2 from 1958. Since Peter R. McLeod died in 1965, well before the 1976 publication of the tune under the title John C. Johnston, I must assume that the Eadcath Collection reports a more accurate title since it was published during the composer's lifetime. Thus, I prefer to title the tune Morag Ramsey. However, the United States Bicentennial Collection was compiled with the aid of Peter R. McLeod Jr., and so we might also assume some knowledge by the composer's son about the composer's wish to rename the tune. But why this renaming? I am unsure. Again, if anyone comes across this video and has a good answer to this conundrum, pun totally intended, please let me know. Until then, I will trust the composer over the composer's son. Morag Ramsey is in A hexatonic, omitting the C-sharp from the bagpipe scale. This gives the tune that idiomatic medieval sound. Are we in major or minor? Who knows? 
The ambiguity, as with any tune in this mode, is quite haunting. The technique in this work is unquestionable. The second part's movements between low G and high G are quite tricky. The torluas in the third part are a true test of relaxed and precise playing. The fourth part requires further relaxing of the hands with the many tap-down gestures. All the while, the tune, for all its exceptional difficulty, is simply majestic. This is a perfect example of Peter R. McLeod's penchant to write difficult pipe music that is ultimately rewarding to struggle with and conquer. Let's listen to the second part of this work, which begins halfway through the second line of the score. The 6-8 March, Captain Charles Hepburn, is another haunting piece in A Hexatonic. If you are a piper that loves the widely acclaimed Pipe Major Donald McLean of Lewis by Donald MacLeod, then you will also love this tune. I wouldn't be surprised if Donald MacLeod was inspired by this tune when he composed Donald McLean of Lewis. Donald McLean of Lewis was first published in 1967 in Donald MacLeod's fourth book of pipe tunes, which was two years after the death of Peter R. MacLeod Sr., and so it is possible that Captain Charles Hepburn was known to Donald MacLeod. The preponderance of G's in this tune lended a further modal ambiguity. To my ears, I am not sure that the tune is truly an A hexatonic. We might be an E hypodorian. In Renaissance music theory, we might call this work bimodal. Its final notes are A, but the harmonic and melodic scaffolding otherwise suggest E as a nearly equal final. To highlight this fact, I have harmonized the performance here with only an E drone. Here we will listen to the first part of Captain Charles Hepburn. We have not yet showcased Peter R. McLeod's other most widely played tune aside the conundrum, his 6-8 march pipe major Sam Scott. This tune is not only popular, but it is also distinctive in the genre. The 6-8 march demonstrates over the course of four short variations, nearly all of the most iconic characters of any 6-8 march. Lilting rhythms, poised long short rhythms, dense grace note configurations, and nearly absent grace note configurations. Consequently, there is much contrast in this work, though all this contrast is compositionally held together as one clear whole. Let's listen to both the third and fourth parts of this piece, since they will best demonstrate this contrast. Peter R. McLeod's reels also demonstrate extraordinary intellect and compositional multiplicity. First is the Highlander's Institute. 
Here again, Peter uses the conceit of withheld notes to add freshness to subsequent variations of his tunes. As you listen to this tune, notice the first use of D in the third part. The arrival of this note is absolutely superb. It is like we didn't even notice it was missing until it's revealed. And then we ask ourselves how we had not missed it before. Of course, this technique is not unique to Peter, but he utilizes it with such a plum. We will also notice the subtle shift in the preponderance of Bs and F sharps in the third and fourth part. While the first and second part had Bs and Fs, they were relatively underemphasized. Once the D is introduced in the third part, we have a noticeable shift of harmonic structuring and the added weights on B and F. The fourth part is a tour de force of real rhythm and articulation. While the real John Morrison of Assant House is wild, the Highlanders Institute is truly a masterpiece of the form, a perfect balance of traditionalism with Peter's signature push, along with all the trappings of careful and thoughtful composition on a deep level. Since this work is short, let's listen to the whole of the Highlanders Institute. The final tune I would like to address is the real Donald McLean. There is debate as to whether this tune is by the senior or junior McLeod. For Piper's extensively knowledgeable of the repertoire, there is a tune by Peter R. McLeod Jr. with the same title, but the tune is totally different and has the subtitle RMS Athena. I will look at this other tune as part of my separate series on Peter R. McLeod Jr. As for the singularly titled real Donald McLean, all but one source lacks specific attribution beyond only noting that the tune is by Peter R. McLeod. John Wilson, though an early publisher of Peter R. McLeod Sr.'s works, did not publish Donald McLean in any of his three volumes. Thus, as far as I can determine, the earliest publication of this reel is in the Edcath Collection Book 2 from 1958, which seems like a likely first appearance given its contemporaneousness with the composer's life. At this point in the composer's history, Specifying father versus son was probably not important since the son's works were not yet widely disseminated. Thus, for most pipers of that day, a work by Peter R. McLeod clearly meant senior, and so a publisher would have not thought to specify. Furthermore, the style of the tune is certainly in line with the virtuosity and quirkiness of John Morrison of Assant House, and so it seems reasonable to assume a kinship between the pieces. However, and interestingly, in the bicentennial collection I mentioned earlier, there is a reel under the title Duncan McIntyre. This reel is remarkably similar to Donald McLean from the Edcath collection. Yet again, another example of the Bicentennial collection renaming an earlier published tune. Furthermore, and most importantly, the Bicentennial collection attributes the work to Peter Jr. And since Peter Jr. was consulted in the compilation of this volume, we can assume this attribution is reasonably accurate. Given lots of debates surrounding the attribution of this tune to either father or son, it might simply be fair to say that they might have both had a hand in the making of this tune. Since the edition we find in the Bicentennial Collection is different enough from the Edcath Collection's version, we might fairly assume such changes are the work of the son's hand over the father's original ideas. To be fair, I plan to release a recording of Duncan McIntyre in my series on Peter R. McLeod Jr. However, I will attribute the earlier version of the reel, Donald McLean, to Peter R. McLeod Sr. The tune itself is delightful for its modal ambiguity. However, Peter has taken this ambiguity a step further and leaving out not only the C-sharp, but also the F-sharp. As a consequence, we lose all sense of major or minor modality. We have no notion of a raised or lowered third or sixth scale degree. 
This lends a refined, yet nobly primitive air to the tune. Peter, though, always one to hold out a note for our anticipation, delivers us the C-sharp defiantly on the first beat of the penultimate measure. It's quite the little surprise at the end of the tune, almost like Peter is wryly winking at us from over half a century ago through the notes we hear. Why the C at this point? What inspired its inclusion? We will likely never know, but it's just another marker of the skill, intuition, and artistic insight of this composer. Let's conclude with a final listening. Here is Donald McLean, the reel by Peter Armacloud Sr. A rendition of all of Peter R. McLeod Sr.'s published original compositions is available on my YouTube channel as part of the playlist, Bagpipe Composer Series, Peter R. McLeod Sr. I encourage you to listen to all of them and enjoy this marvelous composer's output. While most bagpipers today are familiar with only a handful of tunes by this composer, such as The Conundrum, Pipe Major Sam Scott, and John Morrison of Assant House, there are very many excellent tunes that arguably deserve more acclaim than any of the three tunes just now listed. Enjoy, and please keep seeking good music. Thanks. <laughs>